the slime of carrion crawlers, giant snails or giant slugs, and two or more of these rubbery, orange-hued, harmless if eaten, but neither nourishing nor tasty cave fungi. It is time for a new lore video. <laughs> Welcome back, folks, to another Realms lore video. I am here with Ed Greenwood, the original creator of the Forgotten Realms. If you are enjoying these videos, please consider liking, subscribing, and turning on notifications so you can know when the next one comes out. And also, please consider going to patreon.com slash edgreenwood, where you can get tons of works in progress, uh, more exclusive Realms lore and other great stuff, and the support from that Patreon is what allows us to continue making these videos here for you. So please enjoy. Eddie, anything you want to lead him in? I will bring you more lore. And here it is. <laughs> Often overlooked, drow mechanicals. Most folk of the surface realms think of drow as evil, dangerous, spider-worshipping elves who rule the Underdark, except the places where dwarves reign, largely because they wield powerful enchanted weapons and hurl nasty spells. Some of these same folk might well be surprised to know that there are drow smiths who make metal tools, weapons, armor, and fittings. Locks, hinges, hasps, coffers, and more. Among the most interesting the things drow make are mechanical limbs, most often hands or full or partial arms fashioned to replace missing flesh originals. These body augmentations are collectively known to drow and elves by the same name, Reskzon, and to all others as drow mechanicals. One such, a right arm, is depicted at the top of page 87 of Drow of the Underdark, the second edition source book I wrote and TSR published in 1991, not the later tome of the same name. Interestingly, they don't make use of adamantite and aren't affected by sunlight. They aren't even forged, but are made by an entirely different process. Over centuries, drow smiths have become masters of precision machine casting, the making of molds, the crafting of alloys, and the finishing of surfaces to a surface of desired texture, hue, and durability to create limbs with fluidly bendable joints that are capable of deft, precise movements via rigid wire-like control rods bonded with the user's surviving muscles for natural control. This method of limb control allows for the grafting of extra limbs for crude uses, such as a pair of hands used only for holding and carrying items, not wielding them, so a drow can have two extra hands holding wands at the ready that its active hands aim by grasping wand or hand. These mechanical additions can have fleshy pads from the drow itself added to the mechanical digits and magically linked, so the extras count as part of the drow itself for purposes of controlling, guiding, focusing, and grounding magics. A drow may use mechanicals to replace its own damaged, withered, or diseased and weak limbs, to gain extra limbs, or to be able to use limbs stronger or for more durable or precision suited to a given frequent task than its own. Most drow alloys, the precise compositions of which are closely guarded secrets among smiths and their apprentices, and more rarely among all interested members of a drow family or noble house, tend to be copper and nickel-rich variants of electrum, itself an alloy of gold and silver. A typical drow alloy might have 12% nickel, 10% copper, traces of platinum and chromium, 40% silver, and the remainder gold. Older mechanicals made greater use of aluminum and platinum, but current drow railzund smithcraft cleaves to nickel and copper relegating platinum and aluminum uses to sculptures and other adornment castings, rather than for tools, weapons, and mechanicals. All drow alloys are glossy, reflective silver in hue, durable hard rather than brittle, and blue in reflections, but some are also deliberately blued or greened or even made purplish or red by enchantments, including the blue shine spell well known across Faru. Drow alloys often bear the names of their creators, mate to zrebel, which means alloy or metal amalgam. 
that is, a liquid mix of metals unfinished as part of a making process, to drow, so one can hear of the big three, or popular alloys, of arrazable, camarrazable, nurrazable, among others. Drow make their casting molds of cave grit and sand mixed in precise and usually secret proportions with the slime of carrion crawlers, giant snails or giant slugs, and two or more of these rubbery, orange-hued, harmless if eaten, but neither nourishing nor tasty cave fungi, a habra, evmelgra, and relotra. The results are a strong, flexible, rubbery substance that doesn't melt or ignite when exposed to heat or flame, but evaporates from outer surfaces slowly over time when heated, so molds become thinner and thinner until they are breached or collapse. It's customary to cradle or support molds in stone, metal, or even wooden forms to prevent deformation under weight and stress. Drow casting molds are coated with neglar, cave glowworm, essence for easy removal of castings. The abundant, slow-moving, mindless, and harmless, unless you are yourself a mold or fungus upon which they feed, flatworms are crushed, their jelly-like innards boiled, and the result skimmed of impurities to result in a clear, wine-vinegar-smelling, greasy lubricant that never grows rancid, but over time evaporates and diminishes in both coverage and efficacy. The style of modern drow mechanicals are an outer shell of overlapping, shifting plates, often rings that slide freely over each other and are individually anchored by short chains to an underlying armature that cover an inner frame or armature and shelter space for the control rods to move without binding or being hampered by outside surfaces. The best drow smiths are the equal of the best gnome and dwarf smiths in casting and in repair and maintenance of precision parts, such as metal internal lock mechanisms. And far more drow master casters exist at any time than gnome master casters, who in turn outnumber dwarf master casters. Though dwarves outstrip all other Ferunian races in skills, speed of work, and numbers of master smiths when it comes to hot forging, the classical anvil hammering of metals heated in a hot fire, and have done for as long as properly recorded history stretches back. Long ago, it became customary to hide keys, lock picks, small tools, and weapons within drow mechanical limbs, and to engrave them with glyphs that could be inspelled to store spells for instant release by touch and utterance of an activation word. A limb could have any number of glyphs graven on it, but only one could be carrying magic at a time. The inspelling of a second glyph would cause the first glyph to go off, releasing its magical effect uncontrollably, and this magic would drain and be augmented wildly by the second spell. In usual functioning, such glyphs glow, so they are clearly visible to others, as they are discharging, that is. A wearer donning a drow mechanical is instantly aware of any stored magic within it and the means of unleashing such magics. If the mechanical is already a part of them when it is inspelled, their awareness of the nature and triggering of a magic is instant upon the inspelling being completed. By far the most common inspelling of drow mechanicals is a minor, everyday function. The ability to open magical locks or create a temporary breach in walls of force or other magical barriers or fields by touch or close proximity, so a wearer of a mechanical can freely move about areas of the family compound or cavern network or mansion they belong to. If such enchantments aren't damaged, they survive separation from their wearer, so a foe who gains possession of the mechanical or the severed limb it's attached to or being worn by can also pass locked doors and magical barriers as if they were the former wearer. Common mechanical enchantments include augmentations of the wearer's strength and the ability to emit radiances of controlled hue and intensity, sometimes directional, like a searchlight or flashlight beam. These are rarely strong enough to be blinding, and a magical effect that continues to be unreliable and sharply limited due to interference from fluctuating phase rest radiations is flight. A typical drow mechanical 
can boost a wearer's leap or dive by a few feet, or soften a descent by partial featherfall at best. Unsurprisingly, many drow smiths craft articulated spiders, ranging from small buckles, cloak pins, and body adornments, right up to gigantic enchanted fighting automatons used as vault and door guardians. A recent fad among drow is to make ambulatory tables that look like spiders and can fold or flip over into lounge chairs. Such as the pride of drow, cleaving to themselves first, family and house second, and city third, that they seldom celebrate or recall innovators of the past. However, the names of two female drow crafters are remembered. Everel Vrusuz, who first cast intricate limbs and digits as opposed to hammer-forging cruder body replacements, and Clathlone Arodra, who first perfected the engraving of multiple glyphs that could take enchantments on the same mechanical. However, many drow houses claim these individuals as their own in many underdark locations, and all that's certain is that these two individuals lived and died long ago. And that is all we have on Drow Mechanicals. Hi, welcome back to Realm Speak, and this time around, we're doing Gondolgrim, a nice little dungeon I created years and years and years ago, yeah, before before, there was a thing called Drist. There was Gontelgrim. I created Gontelgrim in 1967, I think. Gontelgrim. There are two Gontelgrims in the realms. There's the dungeon, and there's the abandoned city. And they are side by side. And the Gontelgrim that you uh, would have seen in the realms before Drist explored it was a, an abandoned gnome city that had been abandoned because um, it used for its air source a, an extinct volcano, a hollow mountain with an opening to the sky in the center. So um, this could be used with a large shafts to, to make sure the entire city got enough air. And guess what? A dragon thought it was a great lair, and down it came. And no more Gontelgrim. <laughs> 